conversation with the lovely Kimberly Jones. Let's give her a round of applause. So one thing about me, I do like a lot of energy. We're gonna get a lot of energy from Kimberly herself. So we just wanna make sure the energy that she's putting out into the crowd, we get that energy back. So as we're going through, we're gonna knock this out in about 30 minutes, but I do want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions. So if you need to write down your question, get it down, just make sure you're being attentive, and also make sure you're getting the information that you want. Is that all right with y'all? Yeah. All right, so this is the I Am Creative talk, and I just wanna make sure, do we have some creatives in the house? Woo! All right, so on the count of three, I just want you to say, I am creative, but say it with conviction, say it like you mean it, say it like you have no question about it, all right? On the count of three, one, two, three. Oh, y'all better talk. Y'all better talk to me. All right, Kim, we're going to get started. Kim, I'm going to give you the, the mic. That way you don't have to project. I'm going to project, and you just take it, all right? Thank you. I, I love you. I've been looking at your Instagram. All, uh, since, 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 all right, y'all. So as I mentioned, we're going to have an in-depth conversation here with Kimberly Jones. If you don't know who Kimberly Jones is. Oh, Everybody must. Everybody must know. But today we're going to be discussing how she handles the ins and outs of almost every aspect in both industries, from writing to producing and even budgeting. Inspired by her passion by storytelling, Kimberly Jones shares her expertise during this live in-person masterclass. Can we get it up for a masterclass? <laughs> Caring too much because his work is heavy, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I spend half of my week 
going with mothers to identify their children's bodies, mm -hmm. you know? And so the way that I keep that balance is saying that, you know, we are all multifaceted. So the, the angry black woman that people enjoy in me is not me in totality. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, you know, I'm gonna have bad days too and I have to remind myself that I'm more than my worst day. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I keep that balance. So to answer your question, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always the, because I'm always working at being the best version of myself because I, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago and I heard Minister Farrakhan say when I was eight years old that the most revolutionary thing you do is self-improvement. And I've carried that with me my whole life. Oh my goodness, right, that's a word. And it's a lot of things that you said there. Um, for me, like when I when I see people, especially like you that do a lot of work in our community, which we love and appreciate, it always makes me wonder like how this all began. And you actually put a quote, and I and I want to quote: "There's no way to nurture empathy in people unless they know the whole story." And a lot of uh, that entire entire statement struck me in the heart. But that last part about the full story, you know, just knowing who a person is. So can you paint the picture of what it was like for the young Kimberly Jones growing up, like? What, what was that like for you? Who, who were you before the Kimberly Jones that we knew, we know today? Same, exactly the same. I, I, I tell people this all the time, that like this this life was, my, was what I was destined for. Mm -hmm. And so spirit, um, which is why I tell everybody to like relax, man. Just <laughs> relax, man, put some, burn some incense, sit in your house, put on that music that you like, have a glass of wine, if that's what you enjoy, because when you relax, you will keep Spirit will talk to you, spirit will guide you, it'll show you who you should be dealing with, who you shouldn't be dealing with. You know, we grow up hearing about this gift of discernment, but nobody teaches us how to activate it. Yeah. And nobody teaches us how to know when we're hearing from the creator versus when we're hearing from the self, from the ego. You know, and so part of that is being calm, a calm, a, a calm man is a thinking man. And so because I was a calm kid, you gotta keep my, I'm the baby of seven kids. So when you the baby seven kids, they don't need a toy, you are the toy. <laughs> <laughs> but like my brothers, one time, I had to wear a neck brace when I was eight for like a week because my brothers thought it would be funny because they shared room and they had twin beds to throw me back and forth between the beds. And I landed on my head. That's livable. Yeah, I got four brothers. Lord, oh, help me, Jesus. Um, and two really sweet sisters. But what, so what it is, is like, because I've, I've learned to, to be quiet, to right. be quiet, to kind of get out of your way a little bit, uh, the way I want to be a toy, um, it opened me up to be open to things. So like, for example, my, my babysitter, when I was a kid, was a former panther. So when she would babysit me, she would play like Dick Gregory records for me. Mm. That was her version of babysitting. You know, she taught me about move. I remember when move happened, I was eight or nine before happened because my babysitter was talking to me about it. Wow. And um, and for those of you who don't know, know about MOVE, you should look it up. We, we talk a lot about Tulsa and stuff that feels so far away. Um, MOVE was a compound of black revolutionaries that was bombed in 1984 mm. in Philadelphia. Um, and so, you know, we, I was, I was always put in those kind of positions. Um, my mother, because I was, I was a little bit bad, Right? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. My mother went to the grocery store on Saturday mornings and she wouldn't want to take me because I would, you know, act up. Show out. <laughs> and so she started leaving me when I was about 10. She started leaving me at the Carter G. Wilson Library, which at the time had the largest collection of African American studies. And so on Saturday morning, she would leave me there and the librarians got to know me. It was a different time. She couldn't do that now. But, you know, it's 1986. I'm old. Um, you know, the librarians would let me just run around the library, but then when I would calm down, because I have ADHD, when I would get the run out of me and I would calm down, I would sit at a table and they would just load the table up with books. And I, I had a teacher in seventh and eighth grade, this one who I thank in my last book, who recognized, like, because I, I didn't get diagnosed with ADHD until I was a kid, but would recognize, like, this kid isn't dumb, because people try to convince me I was dumb. This kid isn't dumb. She just needs to burn some energy. Once she burns the energy, she'll be fine. So her way of burning energy, because she knew what my mother would do on Saturday mornings, is like when I would get anxious in class, she would be like, Kim, do you want to teach? And I would be like, yes. 
Wow. And I would stand up and teach critical race theory, black history, and all of that when I was 10 for an hour until I calmed down. And so, you know, I went to after school programs at, at Operation Push. I went to after school programs at the Dusaba Museum. I went to after school programs at the Ebony Theater of Arts. I was put in all of these places where learning about my people, the real stories, the real stories about my people and learning the power of the word. That all of this education, all of this knowledge, all of this lost information that I was learning that I was so fascinated by was in a book. And so I fell in love with both. I fell in love with fighting for my people and I love, fell in love with the red book. That's beautiful. So it's not just on you, it's literally in you. Oh yeah, it was, it was, I mean, my plan was my plan before I got here. Mm -hmm. so. That's absolutely right. Now, one thing I know for us, especially as creators, sometimes, and you kind of hit on it a little bit, you know, we, we go, we go, we go all the time. And then sometimes we just run ourselves right, and sometimes the inspiration can kind of kind of go a little bit, or, or not, not just be as visible to you. How do you maintain your inspiration as you continue your journey to evolve? Because I don't look to inspiration to be my motivator. I look for consistency to be my motivator. But inspiration comes and goes. So if I'm waiting on inspiration, I'll be waiting. Um, people ask me how do I deal with writer's block. I don't have writer's block. And the reason I don't have writer's block is because I accepted a long time ago, I'm not a good writer. And that's not, uh, nobody's a good writer. James Baldwin wasn't a good writer. Tony Morrison wasn't a good writer. Well, we are great editors. We can't edit a blank page. So I accept that I'm gonna put shit on the page first. <laughs> and then I'm gonna walk away from it, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna fix it. Yeah. This, the reason people get writer's block is the false expectation of perfectionism. Mm. So you think you gotta put something amazing on the page and you're not, then you get upset, you get frustrated, you say it's not coming. It is coming, right? Your first draft, crap. I tell, I tell young filmmakers that, if you shoot your first draft, I don't respect you. I don't. My book, I'm Not Down For You Tonight, which for the record is a New York Times bestseller, NAACP Image Award nominated, with Barnes & Noble's Book Club of the Month, has been citywide reads for 32 cities, had 28 drafts. Wow. wow. 28 drafts. So a lot of times, even when I'm talking to young writers or creator, I tell them that the problem is twofold. Yes, this industry is not pro you. That is a fact. I would never deny that. But the second thing is, some of y'all weren't just ain't good. And the reason that it isn't good is because your inflated ego put the first set of words on the page and you're like, this is the thing. Maybe that isn't the thing. That's the start of it. But there's no way you crafted perfection in one draft. And yet you're trying to sell it and you say they just don't like black creators. No, they don't like shit. <laughs> that shit. <laughs> Shine it. So how, how do you right, snap, 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 see it. How do you take someone that, that may be in that mindset, right? And especially, I mean, they may be in the room and they're like, okay, hey, I, I realize she's talking about me, but I want to make that switch. What advice would you give them to do that? To switch from, to switch that off and turn that off? After you get that first draft done, walk away from it for a week or two. If I had one more person on the internet talking about, I did 80,000 words in a week, go me. And, and so, that's not, that's not, you ain't getting a cookie. <laughs> Write it, stop rushing everything. Patience is a virtue. Gilly and I started writing I'm Not Dying with you tonight in 2015. We wrote on it for two years. That's how you got 28 drafts. No, that's how you got 25 drafts. We sold it in 2017. Then it had to go to a developmental editor, another draft. A sensitivity reader, another draft. A copy editor, another draft. And then it was published in 2019. Didn't make the New York Times best seller list until 2020. It's been a five year journey. And most people don't have that kind of patience. They want to write it today, publish it tonight, get an award tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and so. If you don't have, if you're not blessed like I was to have other writer friends who can beta read for you, to have a whole editorial team that can edit for you, you can turn anybody who is a writer into an editor. And this is how you do that. You use the CBD method. 
you give somebody who you know reads a lot, because that's, I mean, that's the great thing. It is a reader who knows what it looks like when it's good, who knows what books they do and don't like. You give them that draft and you tell them, I want you to use the CBD method and you're going to edit this one. So every time you read something where you're confused, write a C in the margin. Every time you see something in your board, put a B in the margin. Every time you see something you don't care, put a D in the margin. Now if they're confused, that means you're not conveying the information correctly and you need to fix it. If they're bored, that means your pacing is off. And then if you need to adjust the pacing, it's moving too slow, there's stuff in there you don't need, you need to gut that section. And then if they don't care, it probably just needs to go. It's probably not pushing it. But you wouldn't do that with one person, you're gonna give this to five people, and you're gonna get it all back, and you're gonna compare the notes, you can see where there's a C consistently, where there's a B consistently, where there's a D consistently. And now you can, now you can work out that next drive. That is nice. And I think that applies not only to writing, but even when I'm thinking about the film industry, you know, creating shows and being able to, to see the pacing and all that. So I'm definitely going to make a deal with that. But I do want to ask you, you know, the arts world, and I think there's this negative connotation on the arts world. It's like you can you be that starving artist and, and you may not <laughs> make it. Right. It, it, so, you know, knowing that that was uh, the theme of it, what made you decide to, to still go that path anyway? Because you're not just a writer. Like you said, you, you do multiple things. Mm -hmm. So what made you start to explore those different things? My mom. Oh. May she rest in peace. I just lost. Oh. My mother. My mother did amazing things in her life. And was not given the proper credit. And what she saw in this world was an opportunity for her kids to do the work and get the credit. You gotta keep in mind, my mother was a leader in AI. My mother programmed robots that delivered the mail into Sears Tower in 1976. Mm -hmm. My mother was the first waitress at the Playboy Mansion. Not the first black the first hired waitress at the Playboy Mansion mm -hmm. in Chicago. A lot of people don't know who that nurse was from Chicago. Started there and they moved to LA. His first mansion, the first waitress he hired was my mother. She was hanging out with her two favorite cousins, um, Clive Smith, who built, who was an engineer, worked at NASA, and actually built the boosters on the moon landing, rocket ship. Mm -hmm. And his brother, Marquis the Magnificent, Daredevil, only man to challenge Eagle and Eagle to a jump and beat him. So when you're surrounded by greatness like that in your lifetime, and you share blood with them, and you see how the world didn't give them what they owed, especially my mother, you will never allow yourself to not get whatever it is that you deserve. And you will not allow yourself to be in a position where they don't give you the credit. And so you will work harder. But most importantly, you will work smarter. And you'll have to understand, I understand that I carry their legacy. That, you know, my next book that I'm publishing is my mother's biography. And I only get to do that because of the work that I've done. That puts me in a position to publish her book mainstream and to know it's going to be printed in 44 languages. But I owed her that. And my mother was super supportive and never let me quit on my creativity, even when I was failing at it, even when I wasn't successful, even when I was calling Tamika and Nicola like, sis, can you catch that for $20? Get to this event. And you got to surround yourself with good friends. I remember the first time I was nominated for a big award, and I didn't know how I was going to get to the award. Me and my girlfriend activated like Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> one was like, I'm going to get your shoes. The other one was like, I'm going to get your dress. One was like, I got a credit card. got enough money to get your ticket. You going. So, so that's one of the things that I talk about in How We Can Win in that section. It's about the nine priorities in a relationship. I teach people how to curate those relationships. 
Listen to me. This is the best advice an old lady can give you. You ain't that old. Shout out to me. You look so pretty. Um, it is okay to not allow people who are tornadoes in your life remain in your life. I don't care if it's your mama. This time goes fast. I was eight, then I was 25, and then I woke up and I was 46. And I'm gonna blink and be 56. And then I'm gonna wipe my head and be 80. And so this time is finite. If you think about your time like it's currency, you will be more conscious about who you give it to. You got a cousin right now sending you a cash app request, didn't even text you. You're like, I ain't finna get Nikki a dime because I already know <laughs> what she's gonna do with that money. But yet you're so frivolous with your time. I have a curated list on my phone, 10 people in my favorites. And when I am busy and when I am tired, those are the only 10 people who can reach me because I don't want to hear a 45 minute conversation about your boyfriend and they've been shit for 30 years and you still tell me the same story. <laughs> I've worked very hard for my time to have even more value than it has before. And so, can you just call Beyonce? No, because she understands the value of the work that she's done and what that time with her costs. That's why she don't need to be on social media. Why would she give time to that? And so half of the battle that many of y'all facing is your best thoughts. The energy that is around you is not productive. Mm -hmm. It's not inspiring. It's not uplifting. It's not pushing you to the next level. It's not curating opportunities for you. My friends are beast. Beast, and they're in positions where all the time they're opening doors for me, and they get to have cachet on my celebrity, if you will. It's an exchange, fair exchange, it's no robbery. Mm -hmm. Fifi, right here, Fifi knows if she's having an event, I'm coming, but I know if I go to Fifi's event, I'm gonna sell some books. Tamika knows if she's having an event, I'm coming, but if I know, I, I know if I go to one of Tamika's events, I'm gaining a new audience. Bobby knows if he want me to be in a movie, I'm gonna show up. But I already know the quality of work that he does. I can't count how many of his, his short films have gone viral. So why would I not when he says, Kevin, come do this for me real quick? Okay, it's a fair exchange. So how are you curating your experiences? People always say, well, I ain't gonna let nobody use you. We using each other all the time. The question is, are, is the way you get used enjoyable? <laughs> you get enjoyed in misery all the time. You get used in misery constantly. You okay with that? But you haven't thought about how to curate your life so you're getting used in enjoyment. We have to get emotionally mature and recognize the ways in which we elevate our lives and the way in which we make choices, good or bad, that determine where we land. Now, I don't know. I haven't seen therapists on here, but she's gone ahead. I just lost my left. I'm like, I'm going to call Kim. 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 I'm No, but I, wanna, I do want to say, you know, sorry for the loss of your mother. I do appreciate you being vulnerable yes. in that moment, yes. though, and just being yes. able to let the tears fall and still talk through. That, to me, means so much. And I know sometimes, and I recently watched the, um, interview with Lauren London and she was just talking about how we don't know how to talk about death or how to, you know, talk to people that have experienced that. And one thing I learned from that was just say, I'm not, I can't fix, I know I can't fix it, but I want to give you my love and give you what I can in this moment. So thank you so much. And still being able to pour after expressing something like that. So thank you so much. Um, so I've given energy. I want, I want to make sure we open the floor before we close out. So as I mentioned earlier, I want to give you all the chance to ask Kimberly some questions. So if anybody has a question, just raise your hand. I'll um, point to you, you say your name, what you do, and then your question. And you raise your hand. So she was like, oh, no, I'm going to say my name. Hi, everybody. My name is Lex. 
Um, I'm an owner of Batty Visual, which is a video production agency that's launching this Monday. Congratulations! Um, Thank you for both of you being here, for pouring into us. You are one of the realest people <laughs> I have ever heard. And um, I just thank you for being present in that, existing in that. And you talked about how we're not great writers, we're, we're, we're the editors, that 28 draft process. At what point did you say, okay, I can stop here? Like, what made it 28? Because yeah. The, the my deadline for my publishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ma'am, <laughs> turn it in for Christ's sake. Okay. But I mean, cause you 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 never um like, you know like, are there any other authors in here? So raise your hand. Okay. So how many of y'all is looking at your final manuscript? You still find stuff that you like? How did all of these edits and how did this still get in here? Yeah. Right. So you it, it never it never really finished. It never really feels like it's finished. Like I just I just read my first book again for the first time in years and realized it had a typo in it. I'm like 28, 28 drafts, three editors, 40 translations and still. Yeah. Um so you know it just never feels that way. But you know you have to you have to know what your end game was in terms of your storytelling. Like what was the message you wanted to convey, and so usually that's the best way to gauge when you're done, is is this message conveyed in a way that I could, if I wanted to, it may not be appropriate to do so, but if I gave it to an eight year old, they could comprehend what my message was meant to be. Mm -hmm. Is my message clear? Like, and how, how we can win, you know, I call it my, my Forrest Gump tale, because I use, it's part memoir, and I use my life to walk us through the, the economic impact of America on black Americans. But I knew at the end of the day that How Can We Win was my manifesto for reparations. And so when I finished reading it, and I asked myself, have I given the world everything I would need to get them for them to understand why foundation of black Americans are old reparations? When I got to the point where I felt like that answer was yes, then I, it was done. Congratulations. I saw your hand back here. So, you have a stand up, say your name, and what's your name? There we go. So, my pen name is Righteous Day, but you can find your name. Go by my pen name, not my real name. That's one of the most valuable things I've learned here. And I didn't find my brain. Exactly. I'm an author and a publisher. Going on the point that you were making about the 28 and doing uh, the visions and then there, I can so relate to that because that's where I am. I have like 50 million books, but the book that, that started me in my writing, I cannot let it go because I feel like the book starts evolving and at a different period every time I pick it up. And I feel like the character wants to change, but I want to keep the identity of the book. So in those edits, how do you stay true to the story, but enhance it so that I can release it? I need to release it, I just can't. Trust your characters and not yourself. Okay. Trust your characters and not yourself. The characters will tell you what they want that story to be. And you gotta trust that. Because the biggest mistake that writers make is falling so in love with their original concept that they don't allow the story to evolve in a productive way. You know what I'm saying? So like, and I'm not down with you tonight, we had a character, Marcus, that was supposed to be in one scene. And then Marcus kept talking to us. And he kept finding spaces in the book where he was supposed to be. And then we talked to one of our editors and there was a character in there that didn't work and it was easy, that, that needed to go, but we needed to put something in its place. And that was a perfect place to put Marcus. And next thing we knew, Marcus was in a third of the book. <laughs> and guess what, whenever I go to events, guess who the fan favorite is? Marcus. Marcus. 
Marcus. Everybody wants Marcus books. They like, can we get a Marcus book? I want to know what happened to Marcus. And then, <laughs> <laughs> like, this is not Marcus' story. <laughs> Even, even right now, I'm not down to United States developed for TV and the, the, the showrunner who is. Shut the phone on the Yes, and the, the, the showrunner from the show keeps sending me notes about Marcus, and I'm like, this is not Marcus' story. But Marcus is like, this is my story, girl. You better put me on this page. Girl. All right, we'll take one more question. State your name, what you do, and then your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Shirley. Shirley, John, we could, sure. <laughs> we. Because you got some qualities that I know I got. You got a favorite too, Shirley. We might be good. <laughs> um, uh, first off, condolences on the loss of your mother. Thank I you. lost my mother um, about five years ago, so I didn't. You know, so you lost the last night. Yeah. Right. So yeah. And, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. you know it's yeah. the peaks and valleys. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm get, speaking to that. Um, you mentioned earlier about people not wasting your time. You ain't got time to deal with you. Somebody talking about that baby daddy for 20 years. I don't want to hear it. So dealing with, uh, how do you deal with the things that affect us directly that impact our time? Like losing a loved one. Because I've had my peaks and valleys over the last five years where some years it's I, I get through it. And then some years I'm like, you know, I just want to cry into my pillow. Yeah. So how do you deal with making sure or dealing with the fact that sometimes you steal time from this, you waste time yourself. because of other things? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question, Trey. Um, you ever been to McDonald's? Yes. Have you tried to order a shake? No. <laughs> Any ice cream product? Ice cream, yes. Or did you get it? How'd you get it? Did you get it? No. Yes, I got it. Every time? Yeah, every time. You, I know. you are a unicorn. Oh, you're <laughs> How many of y'all got your ice cream every time? Every time? Yeah, yeah. How many of y'all every other time is machine broke? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so after the machine was broke 74 times, did you go back? Yes. Did you ask for the ice cream again? Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of yes. You know what? Extend yourself the same grace you extend McDonald's ice cream machine. Just because you were stalled by something like a death, does not mean you are not being productive. Because taking the time to sit still and heal yourself was the most productive thing that you could do. Wow. Because if you did not take that time to sit still and heal yourself, when you re-emerged, you would have been that tornado that I was telling somebody else to ignore. Because all of that hurt, pain, trauma, confusion would show up in ways in which you are unaware of and you would get in your own way. You would make unnecessary missteps because you were not healed. So if you have that type of trauma, it's not stealing your, it's never stealing your time to heal yourself. It's never stealing your time to improve yourself. You are preparing yourself for that next mountain that's on the other side by bringing your best self to the table. When you look at stories about great warriors and conquerors, and you look at, you know, you, if y'all are unfamiliar with uh, Gaspar Younger, who is probably one of my greatest um, inspirations. Y'all know about Gaspar? Gaspar Younger came um, pre-America, pre so 13 colonies. Um, actually, pre-13 colonies when the Spanish were participating in the slave trade, he brought Gaspar, an African prince, and what do princes do? Princes need armies. They brought Gaspar to Mexico, and he held off. He formed, he escaped, formed his own maroon army of escaped slaves, um, Mexican people and native people, and held off the Spanish in the mountain of Veracruz for 30 years. He beat the Spanish so long and so bad that eventually they just conceded and decided to leave him alone and give him his land. So right now, if you go to Veracruz, Mexico, and you go to the town of Yonga, you'll find a bunch of Spanish-speaking black folks. Wow. These are the stories they don't tell us. They won't tell you all stories about when you got your ass whooped. They won't tell you stories about when you took ass. <laughs> so, 
the one thing that is true about warriors and soldiers and people like Gaspar is how he won was when his troops were tired, when his resources were short, how he won is that he would retreat to the mountains in lands that he knew the Spanish didn't know. And he would hide for months at a time until his whole army was healed, until they had secretly recovered all of the tools and weaponry that they needed, and then he would go beat them again. But those moments where he was in the mountains recuperating were more important than the actual wars he fought on the ground. So you always want to bring your best self to the table because your best self is less triggered, which means your best self can take advice when you need it. Your best self can give advice when you need to, and you can give it with love instead of disdain so that people can actually receive it. I tell people all the time, my greatest accomplishment has nothing to do with any award I've ever gotten, any money I've ever made, any opportunities I've ever been given. You know what my greatest gift are? My students. My plan is to build an army of 10,000 mini-me's before I leave this earth. That's my real legacy. That's my real work. That's why I do stuff like this is to make sure that every opportunity I've been given, everything that I've learned, every moment that I've, every lived experience that I've had that elevated me, if I don't give it to y'all, I ain't worth a damn. I'm valueless. You know what's one of King's greatest gifts he gave to the world? John Lewis. He left a voice here after him that was groomed by him, that was exalted by him. So how can you show up in your true divine feminine mother goddess unless you are happy, healthy, and whole? Because mothering, whether it's me mothering y'all right now in this form, whether it's me mothering my actual child, whether it's me mothering my students. You know, we have these crazy conversations on the internet about what's feminine, what's not feminine, what's masculine, what's this, what's that, what's this, what's that, what's that, what's this. Mothers birth things. Ideas. Humans. Moments. And then we nurture them to run. So your greatest gift is going to be your gift. So those moments are wasted, queen. Those moments are divine. Instagram jail. 
Yeah, but even, okay, yeah, because I was gonna say preparing for this, I tried to post you on my story and tag you, and it wouldn't even allow me to tag you. Yeah, um, so yeah, sometimes we, oh, even sometimes the fun thing. Yeah, but you know, you know why you know you wanna know how I got banned on Instagram? Please tell me. So shadow banned is really you can yeah. you can see you can yeah, still I'm go like, to her page. You can still go to my page, but like I'm shadow banned. So like I go live, I got over, I have a quarter of a million followers on Instagram. And it'll be like 20 people on my live. Yeah, wow. they don't send out the alerts, and then like I'm not able to monetize my reels anymore. Um, people cannot tag me um, in comments and stuff, all this stuff because I was teaching people on live one day how to um, lobby at the local level. Mm. I was teaching people how to form lobbying packs in their neighborhoods, and I was teaching them the importance of knowing what an MPU is, which is your neighborhood organization, and how you leverage that in order to get money into your neighborhood. And I opened up the city's actual budget on live, and was showing them all the line items that are in the city budget, and what type of nonprofits that people on the live may have that they can go down and apply for the money. And I was telling them, do not feel like you're getting a handout when you go down and take this government money. You 15, you, you 50, you've been working since you was 15. Every straw, every piece of paper, every juice, every shoe, every sock, every watch, every coat, every bag y'all got in on here, y'all paid a tax on it. It's your money. Go get it back. That's the trick of the devil to tell you. See, that's why they do things like that. They'll tell you. Oh, you a welfare queen because you asking for government funds, and then they put it in your head where you're like, I'm not gonna go ask for anything because I don't want to be this. And you forgot that just today you bought a bottle of lotion and you paid a tax on it. You bought a hair product, you paid a tax on it. You bought some lashes, you paid a tax on it. You, <coughs> some of us in here, some of the OGs in here, we've been doing that 30, 40 years. How much money have I given this U.S. government for my people to feel me starving? So I'm gonna teach my people how to go get the money. We talk about the reparations, the money is there. We just don't know how to go get it. Everybody else does. I go down to those meetings. I watch how they give millions of dollars away. I ain't talking about at the federal government, I'm talking about down at Atlanta City Hall. <laughs> Organizations get 1.5 million to service black people and they ain't black. Because we don't know how to charge form the corporations and how to become government sponsored institutions in which we can go down there and get that money. Right now, the city has over 300 vacancies for um, community run committees. So like for example, right now, there's a committee that has a vacancy which means nothing's being done on that committee. A citizen can go down there volunteer for that committee to run it. There's a, a committee called the Fatherhood Commission. So a black man can go down there, volunteer to be uh, to run that committee, organize a bunch of productive black men that he knows, and then get a budget from the city to run it to do fatherhood programs for young black boys. And this is why they don't teach you civics in school. They teach you to vote, man. Listen, poor people vote, rich people lie. <laughs> so because we don't understand lobbying, because we don't understand that politics is local, mm -hmm. we show up in droves for a federal election that you have no control over. Mm -hmm. Even if you give a president the popular vote, they're gonna be, it's still going to get determined by the electoral college. Whereas you can go down here, I can decide tomorrow, Fika, you want to run for commissioner? She said, yeah, a bunch of us can get together in this room, pull our money, have enough money to run Fifi. So when she gets the budget, she has a million dollars for arts, a million dollars for after school programs. And 50% of what your politicians do is budget management. Mm -hmm. Then we're yelling at the executive branch because we don't understand they don't write law. You're yelling at your mayor, your governor, your president. They're not lawmakers. They sign laws in. They do not write policy. You know who the mayor is, but you don't know who your city councilman is, and he's writing the policy. 
And then you think everything that's affecting you is affecting you federally when everything is affecting you locally. Right now, if you go stand on the corner of Moreland Memorial, if you stand on the Fulton County side and you have a user's amount of marijuana, you're going to hear a $50 citation because it's decriminalized in Fulton. You're going to watch walk 10 steps across the street in the cab and go to jail. Now, how do you fix that? How do you fix that is you go, you go look at the bill that was passed in Fulton. You see who created the bill and who sponsored the bill. You go get on their calendar, find a pro cannabis person in DeKalb, ask them can they transfer the policy to them, they have it, they rewrite it based on the bylaws of DeKalb, you get a petition together with all the people in your neighborhood, support them, raise $10,000, give it to their campaign and say I want this policy through, how many people do you need to vote with you, they'll say eight, you go take meetings with 10 other city councilmen who you are pro cannabis. You get them on board, it comes up to floor, you get your team to come down to public comment, y'all all say that you want it, you get it put on the docket, they say yes, the next vote, all the people in the community vote for it, it passes. It's not hard to community lobby. And that's why I'm paying. <laughs> Fuck it out, kid. <laughs> 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 Just key on your neck and you better learn how to 